Hey, today I'm going to add some bling and give some love to my small Amstrad XT machine. So let's see what we've got and put it all together. Hey, today we're going to be looking at this. This is one of the sweetest machines in my collection, I think. This is an Amstrad 5086. So I did a video about this a while back, but I'm going to revisit it today because I've got some extra goodies to go with it. So this machine was a bit of a weird one. It was launched in 1991 It's part of a 5 series. So this is the 5086. There was a 286 model called the 5286, as you might imagine, and they both came out together in 1991, which is very late for an XT machine. This is it's quite a modernization on the XT as well. Everything was kind of shrunk and incorporated onto the motherboard. So it's got built-in graphics. It's got a PS2 mouse, so no need for a serial mouse. And it's got a PS2 connector for the keyboard, though the keyboard itself actually needs to be XT. So originally it came with an XT80 switchable keyboard with a PS2 connector. Unfortunately, I don't have that because that would really be the cherry on the cake with this machine. Hopefully I'll find one one day, but you never know. I love this thing because it's just so cute. It's so teeny and self-contained. It's probably, apart from that weird little pause thing that I did in my last video, the smallest machine I've got. But for a pre-built system, certainly an old uh, XT machine, it's tiny. So we'll just pop the screws off the bottom and then the whole cover just slides off and we'll take a quick look at what's inside. So you can see it's just as cute inside as is, is on the outside. So it's all like very compact. On the right hand side we've got a PSU at the back, we've got a floppy drive which is a 720k floppy drive. It's a three and a half inch floppy drive but it's not standard, it's proprietary as were so many things that Amstrad put out. It's got its own little connector, so it'd be difficult to upgrade if this ever went. And below that, there is an IDE hard drive. Though again, they, they've they fixed the other end of the IDE cable to the motherboard, as far as I could tell the last time I looked at it. So you can get the drive out, but you can't disconnect the cable to add, you know, extra stuff in. But Amstrad were a bit like that. They made things difficult to kind of maintain and upgrade yourself. I think they just wanted you to pay them to do it instead money grabbers they were. Sitting on top there is an Adlib clone that I built from a kit in another video which is quite a cool little project and a cool little card to go with this machine so I'll get that out of the way so we can see what's going on on the motherboard. So over here we've got sound circuitry which has got its own volume knob which is a pretty cool little feature for the PC speaker. Then there's a Siemens 8086 and next to that is an upgrade that I put in since I made the last video which is an Intel 8087 floating point unit. And then we've got a two chip Amstrad BIOS down here. There's a Dallas real time clock there which fortunately is socketed so I put a new one in there the last time I looked at this machine. And then over here we've got our clock crystal, our memory and our graphics chip I believe that is. And over this side is an absolute nightmare to get into. I didn't actually manage to get it quite apart the last time I tried to have a look, so I'm certainly not going in there today. But that's just the drive bays and the power supply, basically. And then below that we've got the PS2 connectors, the PS2 mouse and the PS2 connector for the XT keyboard. And there's not a lot of room for expansion on this thing. It's got a riser card, but there's only two 8-bit ISA slots to put stuff into. So there's one free at the minute with me having a sound card in there. That's uh, just a quick lightning tour of the machine. If anybody's interested in digging a bit deeper, there's that other video. If you want to watch that, I'll put a link in the description. So may as well just get the thing put back together now and have a look at some of those other goodies that I've got. The first thing we're going to look at is the mouse. Now I do actually have a real Amstrad mouse. I believe it's the one that would have come with the machine. It's a PS2 two button mouse, but it doesn't work. I've had it for quite a long time. I may have even had it when I made the last video. So I'm just going to take a really quick look and see if there's anything obvious I can do to get it working again. So on the machine, I've installed Microsoft Word 5.5, which is one of the last versions of Word for DOS. This machine has DOS 3.3 on it because that is what the machine came with. I do actually have the original installation disks that came with the machine and that's what I used to set it up. So 
a load up word and when word hits the splash screen you usually see the mouse cursor appears and you can move the mouse cursor around the splash screen so look in here you can clearly see that isn't happening and then once you get into the word desktop you can see there's no mouse there so you can't operate the menus or anything you can just use the keyboard so clearly not working and this is what it should look like with the Mitsumi so this just proves there's not a problem with the port itself it's actually the mouse that's got an issue Okay, so the first thing I did was take it apart and have a look and see if there's anything obvious. It was very dirty on the rollers and apart from that it looked okay. The traces on the back all looked fine. So there's not much going on here really that could go wrong. The main culprits seem to be either the cable or that IC there. That would be the only two things I could think that would completely stop the mouse being registered at all. If it was a switch or something like that, it would still work. You just wouldn't have a button working or something like that. So I'm going to start with the cable, I think. But before I go any further, I'm going to just going to give the thing a quick clean, get some IPA on those rollers and get any other dirt off this thing that I can find. The next stage of my master plan was to simply open up some other mice and hope that one fitted. It was a bit naive, I suppose. I, I thought, because it's standardised at the PS2 end, it might just be standardised at this end. I've never really paid much attention to mice before, so I've no idea really what goes on inside, outside of the basics for cleaning and stuff. But you can clearly see, once you open them up, they all have different logic boards, so they all have different connectors at this end, and all the cabling is in a different order as well, because they receive the signals coming down the line in different places. So that would have been the quickest and easiest thing to do, but it wasn't going to fly. There was none of the mice that I had had a cable that would fit this mouse without any kind of adjustments. got the multimeter out to test the continuity on all of these cables and straight away I found a problem with that. So I'm, there's basically four cables on here. There's ground, there's the clock cable, there's a data cable and there's a 5 volt cable. And the line for ground was fine, the line for data was fine, the line for the 5 volt had no continuity and the line for the clock had no continuity. So that does suggest that there's potentially a problem with this cable. So before I moved on to look at anything else, I would want to prove that. And since I don't want to break any of my other mice, I don't really have a cable to try it with. So I think I'll put the mouse back together for now and put it to one side, try and get some other cable and then replace this one with that. And hopefully that'll solve the problem. But for now, I'm just going to put it away and we'll hopefully resurrect that fairly soon and put it into the system with the other bits and pieces I've got. Next up, new goodies, two boxed items. So what we've got here is a couple of interesting things. So I'm kind of thinking I might make a little office out of this. We've got a monitor and a printer here. We'll get the monitor out of its box first. And it's this thing that's got me really excited because it's just a funky, funky little thing it's a 10 inch crt monitor so it, honestly it's teeny it's just a really really cool little monitor and i thought as soon as i saw it well a it's an amstrad monitor so i wanted an amstrad monitor to go with my my little 5086 but the 5086 is a tiny little computer as well so what better to go with a tiny little computer than a tiny little monitor oh just look at it it's just beautiful tiny miniature little thing it'd be so nice and sort of lugging around 17 and 19 inch monitors just being able to pick this thing up with one hand and still have that crazy crt gaming experience or whatever there's nothing to this machine on the side there is simply two knobs contrast and brightness on the back there's a big power button and a vga cable and a power cable and that's it no other adjustments no menus no nothing So, cute tiny monitor meets cute tiny PC. Let's get it hooked up and see what it looks like. 
Oh, that's just so cute. It looks like it belongs in a doll's house or something. The keyboard just looks huge. I, I almost need like some crappy little keyboard like you get on Macs. Just, uh, it just dwarfs everything. Okay, it seems to be working, which is good. It's booting up okay. And if we load Word, it does, probably doesn't really show, probably it doesn't show on the camera at all, but this thing is so sharp. It almost hurts your eyes just to look at it. So the monitor and the printer came from the same auction. Nobody else bid for it, so a good price for the two of them together. And while I have bought some dot matrix printers in the past, and I've never actually gotten around to looking at them or using them, we'll get this one out now because I think it'll go rather nicely sitting together with that. I think this machine would look absolutely awesome if I ever find the correct keyboard for it and I get that mouse working. It'll be a proper little funky system. I did wonder why there were two manuals in the box, but more on that later. Looking in the instructions, you can run a test sheet or a test print on one of these machines without hooking it up to a PC, so that's what I did first. Now the ink ribbon that was in there is clearly dry because it did print, but it was very faint and very difficult to read. So I quickly jumped onto Amazon. Well, first of all, I jumped onto Google to see if I could get a replacement ribbon, but none to be found anywhere. And I read a couple of sort of how-to articles on how to re-ink these things. And there were suggestions that you should use stamp pad ink. So I jumped on Amazon and bought a couple of bottles of that and also ordered some tractor feed paper because, well, that just brings back that nostalgia of dot matrix printing. So after I did that, I went to put the box away and saw this thing sort of embedded in the polystyrene at the end. And it turns out there's a brand new unopened ink cartridge in there. So I needn't have ordered that ink after all. But I'm sure it'll come in handy for other printers and stuff in the future. But yeah, brand new, totally sealed printer ribbon for this machine. So we can get that loaded and see if that makes any difference. These cartridges are pretty basic compared to some of them that I've seen. There's a lot of them have a lot of ribbon coiled up inside them, but these are it's just basically two two cogs with a, a loop of ribbon going around them. So I don't imagine these could have even lasted very long back in the day when they were new. So I can use this box to store the old ribbon and at some point I will try and re-ink it with those ink things and experiment with it and hopefully get that a bit more life out of that. But uh, in the meantime, we'll just pop this brand new one into the machine. And it's a simple, they're just like two little plastic cogs with the loop of ribbon around them. And they just clip on in the back and run across the printhead. So super simple. And it certainly looks a bit better. It's not quite lined up. I just have to move my tractor over to the left a little bit. But yeah, it's a bit faint at the top, but it does it works in draft down to the heavier fonts at the bottom, so it's looking a lot more readable. There's a couple of rows of dip switches on the back of the thing for setting various things like language and stuff like that, and one of them is for setting printer driver compatibility. So there's no specific drivers for these Amstrads, you have to pick from a selection of well used standards. So I've set it to use Epson FX range printers. And then the other side of the equation is to go into Microsoft Word. And then you need to run a setup to also install the printer driver that you want to use. So I've installed the Epson FX driver into Microsoft Word. And then we should be good to give it a go and print. Now at this point, things started to go a bit weird. If you remember, I did wonder why there were two printer manuals in the box. And the first attempt to print from Microsoft Word resulted in absolutely nothing happening. There was also some weird glitching on the monitor, which is a bit disturbing, but that seemed to disappear. So I'm not quite sure what that is. I might have to have a look inside and check the caps and check for dust and stuff. Yeah, and it was at this point I realised why there were two manuals in the box. I just suddenly noticed I had the manual for the DMP3160 in my hand and noticed the label was the 2160. And I went outside and checked the box 
and the box that it came in was for the 3160 as well. So I've been assuming I was using a 3160 and I was using a 2160 and the 2160 is not compatible with PCs as far as I can tell. I believe it is for the CPC range of Amstrad computers. So crap, this thing was never going to work. So I thought, well, since I'm in printing mode, I'll get out one of the other printers that I bought but not tried. So I've got this really nice Panasonic color dot matrix printer. Not that I'm going to be printing any color right now, but I thought that'd be a fun thing to have a play around with in the future with some art packages and stuff like that. But we'll just hook it up to this and just actually see if I can get a print out of it. Now this Panasonic is quite a beast and a lot more complicated with a lot more settings than those Amstrad ones, but it was an absolute breeze. Absolute breeze. I put the paper in, I plugged it into the PC and I hit print and it printed perfectly. And this still had ink in its original ribbon, which was a bonus. Like I said, I think this is going to be a fun printer to have a play around with at some point in the future. I was planning on doing... Get, getting hold of some graphics packages and some sort of fun t-shirt printing packages and stuff like that and maybe having a mess around at some point in the future with this but it's good to know that it works so i love this machine and i want it out permanently now and i cleared a bit of desk space but just look at that to the left of it is a packard bell 17 inch monitor and look at the difference in size but to the right of it that's an Atari ST 12-inch monitor, and even that dwarfs this thing. It's a proper tiny little thing. Absolutely crazy. And yes, there is an Amstrad printer next to that. So what happened there was, I knew I'd bought an old Amstrad printer for a PCW system, but I didn't think it was PC compatible. But it is. This is actually the 3160 that I thought I was looking at before. And it was in a bit of a distress disrepaired state it had bits missing the dust cover was missing the stands were missing and so forth and i'd bought it really cheap just to try and get some dot matrix printing going but now i could lift the parts of the 2160 because they're the same the body shells the same and now i've got a completely cool printer and it works perfectly it uses the same ink ribbon and everything so i ended up with my amstrad printer after all So the only thing I haven't tried now is to do some gaming on this thing and see how sharp that looks. So I'm going to have a little look at 688 Attack Sub, which is a game I've been meaning to have a look at for a while. It's just been sitting on my shelf, so let's see how that looks. That looks nice, very nice. It's very sharp. I think I could quite happily play it, even on this such a small sort of screen size. I think I could happily play this game all the way through on this machine. In fact, that's exactly what I'm going to do just to see what it's like. But it's pin sharp, really, really nice little monitor. And I just think the whole aesthetic of the the setup just looks fabulous. I love the printer, the little monitor on top of the little PC, the keyboard. I'm not particularly pleased with. Hopefully I'll find that Amstrad, the proper Amstrad keyboard that went with this machine, though they seem to be very, very rare. And I've been looking fairly consistently for about a year and a half and never seen one ever. So this will have to do if I can't find anything else. Hopefully I'll get that mouse working at least so the keyboard will be the only part of the system that isn't the way it should be. But yeah, look at it. I love the aesthetic of the whole thing, the way that all of the bits sit together and it's just so cute. It's just so cute. I just like, you want to just want to stroke it or something. Anyway, I'm going to continue playing 688 Attack Sub for a while and I hope you enjoyed watching this little system come together. And if you did, it'd be great if you consider giving me a thumbs up, subscribing or leaving a comment. And I hope to see you on the next video. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.